Howdy folks, Lisa here again at Everything is a Lie with the final installment of the Seven Hills trilogy today, The Canal. I do apologise for the delay in getting this to you, but hopefully you'll find that it's been worth the wait. My biggest fear was that in making a video about a thesis, it may turn out to be the most boring video on all of YouTube, but even I'm pleasantly surprised. As we skip through a lot of the regular formalities, I'll summarise some of the local architecture, or the usual suspects, as I've been calling them, and we'll take our time touring the high strangeness that is Rocky Bay and the disappearing limestone of the Seven Hills. The usual suspects include, as always, the post office, disappearing domes with flagpole antenna, stunning architecture belonging to benevolent societies and tall tales about them, the quintessential Aussie pub with an entire floor buried beneath it, except this one is almost entirely exposed and accessible, except at the roadside. There's an old stone church, typically a St Mary's, and also typically built at an odd level. There's red brick galore, and don't forget the arches, even if they're almost buried. We have oldie worldy houses that are built at strange ground levels, and real estate porn with below ground cellars. Things that have since now been lost, and of course, there's the convict built structures with monolithic stones brought in by horse and cart. You'll also find the customary dodgy art deco makeover, but only if you know where to look. And some of the strangest rocks I have ever seen. Let's do it. Wake up and listen. Okay, so where we left off last time, I had found a study of the riverine and underwater archaeological landscapes of Rocky Bay, North Fremantle, Western Australia, by Darren Cooper at the Department of Archaeology, Flinders University, South Australia, written in 2012. Now, I won't read too much of it, and it is 150 pages long, so we'll skip a lot of the niceties and we'll get straight into it. We will read the abstract. The Swan River has been poorly researched with respect to underwater archaeological sites. To date, no systematic archaeological survey has been undertaken of the riverbed and only one volume collating sunken vessels has been compiled. In order to address this lack of research, a systematic archaeological investigation of the Rocky Bay area was undertaken. Rocky Bay is a small bend in the Swan River located approximately two kilometres from Port of Fremantle within the suburb of North Fremantle. In recent years, North Fremantle has undergone a dramatic transformation from coastal light industrial area to a high value residential neighbourhood. The survey found a number of previously unrecorded archaeological sites that represents various phases of industrial development dating to the initial establishment of the colony in 1829. Many of these sites have been adversely affected by redevelopment of areas overlooking and surrounding the bay, which has seen industrial estates give way to residential housing. The aim of the thesis is to demonstrate that the Swan River has the potential to contain undiscovered archaeological sites other than sunken watercraft that can provide tangible links with the past that are no longer found on its shores. I posit that such sites reflect changes in society of the surrounding areas and can provide information towards a broader understanding of land and river usage. And I will posit that we find a heck of a lot more than what Mr Cooper has anticipated when he wrote this thesis as well. Moving on. 
Okay, we will take a look at the soap factory and that is still standing today. I believe that's a significant building. And the nearby Aboriginal site, which is a heck of a lot more than what I bargained for. Uh, we'll also take a close look at some of the images and surveys. But the main focus of this video will be the proposed canal, proposed in inverted commas there, and the drawing the Public Works Department have provided here. This is an absolute clangor. I could make an entire video just about that drawing. Alrighty, I'm going to skip the intro and just look quickly at the study area. Rocky Bay is located in the Swan River, approximately two kilometers inland from the Port of Fremantle. It is a small bay located between Point Direction and Minham Cove. When Europeans first established the Swan River colony, Rocky Bay was described as the most beautiful bay in the Swan River with its high cliffs overhung with peppermint trees, cypress pine and many shrubs. It was overlooked by seven large limestone hills called the Seven Sisters, which was the dominant geographic feature in the area. The waters in the bay were clear and abundant with fish, crab and prawns. Now, we've looked at several overhead images. We'll have a look at a few more. Note that these references are from 1971 there, Downey. And here, Affinity, the source, 1890. I'm not sure what that is and I can't find it. It does look more like a drawing. And where are said peppermint trees and cypress pines here? Today, the western part of the bay is characterised by vertical limestone cliffs with intermittent limestone ledges and small sandy inlets while the northern part consists of a level artificial embankment that leads down to the water's edge. Adjacent the embankment is a shallow intertidal flat approximately three metres wide. The deep water channel of the Swan River follows the northern edge of the bay and is between six and eight metres deep. The bay typically has a tidal range no greater than one metre the water below the cliffs contains several large limestone boulders that have fallen from above. The western cliffs and the northern embankment are vegetated with peppermint trees and smaller shrubs. Much of the original vegetation has been cleared for development, but would have included, it doesn't really matter. Note, 1997 is the reference for this. I'm not even going to attempt to discredit this image. It looks like Photoshop to me but it is missing several old world buildings that predate its 1923 date and it's from the Batty Library which has largely discredited itself already in previous videos. Okay, you'll be happy to hear that we're gonna fast forward a lot right here because the historical context is that the buildings were found and repurposed, the real history was covered up in the last reset and now everything is a lie is trying to make sense of it all. For Mr. Cooper's information, please check out my playlist on the mud flood in context. The true context here is that the changes in the land use, socio-economic and socio-demographic patterns, and the quarrying are a massive cover-up of a previous civilization, far more significant than most of us could ever have imagined. From here, we'll skip ahead to 2.2, did I just say 2.2, to 2.2, and the Aboriginal land use in Rocky Bay and the Woggle Cave. Okay, I'm going to read this as it is and then I'll show you what I actually found on the ground. So Aboriginal land use in Rocky Bay, local Indigenous groups utilised the natural resources of the Swan River for over 40,000 years, reference 1981. Archaeological investigations demonstrate that Rocky Bay, the traditional name for which is Garangup, I'm hope, I hope I'm saying that right, apologies if I'm not, Garangup has been used for 10,000 years. Living a seasonally nomadic lifestyle, the Noongar peoples used a calendar of six seasons that govern when and where they move to take best advantage of the seasonally available resources. In the colder months, they occupied the hills to the east of the Swan coastal plain, whilst in the hotter months, they moved towards the coast. 
Aboriginal groups camped on the banks of the rivers and estuaries to take advantage of the cooling winds that came off the waters and from the ocean. Green, 1984, notes that in spring and summer, fishing was popular in the sheltered bays of Mandurah, Fremantle and Albany, and groups of 20 or more women and children armed with branches drove schools of mullet into the shallows to be speared by the men. They stayed in these locations for as long as conditions and food allowed. Hammond, 1933. Local traditional owners describe Rocky Bay as being a place of significant mythological and ceremonial importance. A large cave on the west side of the bay is called Gangup, from which the bay gets its traditional name and is associated with the story of the Rainbow Serpent. The cave is believed to be the place where the rainbow serpent slept after the great flood flooded all the land between Wanjamup, Rotnest Island, and the coast. This pattern of lifestyle was only interrupted by the permanent settlement of the Swan River colony in 1829. So I stumbled upon the Woggle Cave by accident while I was having a walk around the area. This is the sign next to it, and I'll shortly show you the cave. As one of the most significant woggle, the Noongar Rainbow Serpent sites on the Swan River, the Woggle Cave is believed to have been the place where the woggle entered the limestone cliffs to sleep after creating a large flood that submerged the land between Rottnest Island and the coast. The limestone cave was also used by lime burners, that's a familiar story, from the surrounding industrial business from 1890 to 1914, due to several decades of pedestrian traffic, weathering and unauthorised camping, the cave has now been restricted from public access in an effort to conserve both the cave and the surrounding landscape. Please respect this site and refrain from going beyond this point. Well, I did that and uh, I also looked and realised that someone was living in there. So uh, I didn't feel like I could go in besides being asked not to. But here's an image of the cave and due to the magic of YouTube, who needs heli weird, we have a video of inside it. Let's take a look. Special thanks to Hooper's Mayhem. Now, this is a separate little cavern that he was in off the side. I'll just start from here where he's coming out. And he's looking towards the front of the cave there. And note, it is filled with dirt. I don't know how far down that dirt goes or what's underneath it. Hello, Bobby. And this is inside the cave. Oh... I couldn't help but wonder, was I inside the woggle? The column in the middle is quite unusual. Are we looking at a ruined building? Or the insides of a woggle? Or some other beast for that matter? That looks like a vein. And that's where he was coming out of, one of those little side tunnels. Hard to know. But my jaw nearly hit the ground when I first saw it. Um, reminds me of something that Paul Cook showed. That's Hooper. We'll come back to the anatomy side of it, uh, or the biogeology. Suddenly I feel like I need Stellium 7's help. There is something very strange about that cave. Moving on. So we're going to skip the river transport and the boat building. We know about that from previous episodes. Also the ship building, inconsequential. And we're going to go to the construction of the Fremantle port. The Swan River mouth was once blocked by a large limestone bar which prevented shipping from entering the river. Ships berthed alongside the long jetty where goods were unloaded and moved to a smaller jetty on the other side of the river mouth for loading into smaller boats and barges. 
The Long Jetty and its anchorage were fully exposed to the violent storms of the Indian Ocean, causing vessels to drag their anchors, which resulted in more than one vessel being wrecked. The idea of constructing a channel connecting Rocky Bay to the ocean through the limestone bedrock was considered as early as 1829, but was not actively pursued until 1873-74. The feasibility study for the proposal was undertaken by the Reverend C.G. Nicolay, a noted geographer who arrived in the Swan River Colony in 1870. Other engineers proposed various designs for construction of an external port at the river mouth, as well as for the development of Coburn Sound, a few kilometres south of the river. The project was hindered by indecision, which continued until 1892, when plans were ultimately settled upon by the new Chief Engineer of Western Australia, Mr C.Y. O'Connor. You remember him from the statue. O'Connor proposed the removal of the limestone bar and the construction of a deep water port within the river mouth. The port would be protected by two long stone breakwaters extending from the northern and southern points of the river mouth. The stone for the northern breakwater would be limestone sourced from nearby Rocky Bay, specifically targeting the Seven Sisters formation. Limestone quarrying. Limestone from the hills overlooking Rocky Bay was quarried from the 1870s until the 1960s. It was the primary raw material for many of the early buildings in the colony, particularly Fremantle. However, the volume required for the construction of the port was extensive. Quarrying for the port project began in the early 1890s and finished in 1897. The limestone was transported to the construction site by both rail and barge. A dedicated rail line was built between the quarry and the works and the jetty was established on the river at the base of Stone Street for the loading of quarried stone onto the barges. Tudemen again, 1991. When the port was completed, six of the seven hills had been totally removed and the seventh was severely impacted. A large limestone terrace now exists in their place. And then back to this image. Limestone was also processed in Rocky Bay with either no knowledge of its significance to local indigenous communities or with complete disregard for its importance. Garungup Cave was used as a limestone kiln by T.H. Briggs and Company around 1900. The cave was used to burn down the limestone in the production of quicklime for use as mortar. Lime kilns were also operated by the same company on a site near the Mount Lyle Chemical Works, as previously discussed. Other Rocky Bay industries, in addition to the boat building yards at Point Direction, a soap factory, bulk oil storage facility and the state engineering and implement works, and the Mount Lyle Chemical Works were established on the cliffs overlooking Rocky Bay. While the bulk oil facility was largely self-contained, the other factories required access to the river. Let's look at the soap factory. WH Burford & Sons Soap Factory, circa 1890 to 1959. In 1886, the Swan Soap and Candle Company, then owned by Mr J.W. Bateman, applied to the government for permission to build a landing in Rocky Bay to allow access to his proposed building site for the transportation of goods by water. While there is no record of the landing ever being built, the factory was constructed. By 1896, it was taken over by W.H. Burford and & Sons, and by 1905, a distinctive three-storey red brick building was constructed. The factory produced a range of goods, including a variety of soaps, hand soap, laundry soap, soft soap, and kerosene soap, and stearine candles for underground miners in the evolving Western Australian gold mining industry. That's from the Western Mail in 1911. The mining industry required approximately 27,000 candles per day for its underground workings. The factory boasted numerous production machines. Soap tablets were produced. We don't need to know all those details. Steam was used to melt down the raw tallow to make the soap. Effluent was discharged directly into the river. 
agitation from waves and propeller wash produced a large volume of soap suds giving the bay the colloquial name Soapy Bay. In 1930, the company was taken over by Kitchen and Levers, a combined English Eastern States firm, and operated under the name Perth Manufacturing Co. Limited until its closure in 1959. In the following 20 years, the building was used as a margarine factory and later as a sail loft before being converted into residential accommodation in 1981. So there it is in 1923 purportedly. And here's some images of what it looks like now. So she's definitely old world, red brick, three stories high, potentially more below, can't tell. Uh, engaged columns there, it looks like it's been a re-roof. The rowback arches over the windows, really common in old world buildings I'm finding. And that grassed area there is where the tunnel goes underneath that we're just about to look at. And the Woggle Cave directly across the road from it at the front of that treed area. And from behind with the oldie worldie structure on the left and the new world on the right. Okay, I'm going to leap ahead here to 4.8.7, the soap factory tunnel. And we have a bit of a video of the tunnel just to try and keep things in some sort of logical order for us. Soap factory tunnel. Immediately behind the soap factory foundations is a tunnel leading into the cliff, figure 74. The tunnel is approximately 96 metres long, 1.8 metres high and 1.4 metres wide. While the walls are vertical and for half its length the roof is unsupported, a carved indentation in the limestone indicates a lintel was once fitted at the entrance, probably in association with an earlier gate. On the ground is a series of single wooden planks, 38 centimetres wide and 9.7 metres long, laid end to end. Adjacent the planks, a corroded 5 centimetre diameter metal pipe extends into the tunnel. The tunnel was found to have several distinctive features. See table five, the tunnel has two vertical trunks that lead to storm drains on the street above. The first trunk is located at the only bend in the tunnel. It is a dry wall construction and capped with angle iron, tin sheeting and cement. The second trunk is lined in modern concrete with handholds leading to the surface. After the bend, jarra shoring appears with planks forming a protective ceiling, figure 75. The necessity for the shoring is evident by a roof collapse path part way along the tunnel. Approximately 94.5 metres from the entrance, a storage cavity was excavated which contained several lengths of 5 centimetre diameter pipe and wooden battens. Metal pipes on the floor of the tunnel and in the storage area were used to transport water pumped from the river to below the factory where it was directed up the vertical trunk to the factory and then to the cooling tanks or to be heated into steam. At the same time, effluent from the factory drained into the tunnel and out into the Swan River where wash from passing boats agitated the suds causing them to foam in salt water. Okay, I'll just pop a quick look at that table in. There's not really a lot to tell us there. Examination of the length and angle of the tunnel indicates the tunnel terminates just below the southern side of the soap factory in figure 76. The soap factory consisted of several buildings in addition to the red brick building, figure 77, and the tunnel is believed to have terminated in the vicinity of the glycerin sheds. So this is the tunnel. Just show you the start little bit so you can see going in. That's the gate that's been torn off now. And he will go right through the tunnel, which doesn't seem to have a particular end. So he gets all the way to the other end and then comes back. And I'm gonna do the fast version for you. So 
So about here, he seems to turn around. Coming up here is where he directs the camera up at one of the openings. This does look like the one that is potentially drywalled. It doesn't look like concrete with the handholds. Note that I haven't had the facility or found the way to get down to the tunnel and have a look myself. So I'm having to rely on other footage here. But I don't know, can you see straight lines in there, potential blocks? So although there looks like there's little remnants of red brick here and there, it's all largely just limestone and it's very rough. It actually looks to me like it was cut wet. All I can really say for sure is that it isn't uniform all the way through, as if you just dug a tunnel through earth. That there's definitely different parts or constructions in there. And we'll just hang in there till the end when he gets out and he shows us where he is on the river, which gives me a pretty fair idea of what we're looking at. And note, as he pans the camera up here, I'll slow it down a little bit for you. Oh, there's a little bit of biogeology for us. What is that? Animal, mineral, vegetable? Certainly not just geology. So there we are looking back towards Fremantle direction. And note that green marker there will help us. So that's looking back at Rocky Bay there. Before we move on from the soap factory entirely, we'll have a look at the soap factory pump house 4.8.6. The initial inspection of the survey area found concrete and red brick foundations located adjacent a large limestone boulder immediately beneath the western limestone cliffs, figure 68. Access to the foundations is via a narrow beach on the western side of the bay below the Garangup Cave, the Woggle Cave. The foundations are approximately 3.4 metres by 3.6 metres in size and made of concrete with five courses of brickwork still in place. The bricks have a characteristic English bond patterning with the bricks of the third course placed on end. The bricks appear to have been rendered with a thin layer of cement. In the centre of the foundations is a raised concrete footing approximately 40 centimetres high. On the north side of the foundations, the bricks are laid back from the edge, providing a narrow walkway into the building. Figure 69 shows the building as it appeared in 1970. It was a small building with a door on the northern side, but with no obvious windows. At this time, it appears to have a four-sided triangular pitched roof made of corrugated iron. The walls were an off-white colour, which may indicate cement render. The side scan image of this particular site identified a single large target approximately 4.8 by 2.7 metres in size, figure 70. An underwater inspection found this to be a large limestone block that fell from the cliffs above. On the underwater slope adjacent the foundations is a field of building debris including bricks, cement blocks and steel rod cascading down the slope, figure 71. Pipes up to 4 metres long and an eight metre long steel beam were also present. In addition to construction debris, a variety of modern materials are also present. This includes many amber glass beer bottles, a portable traffic sign and tires. Jutting out of the brick debris is a metal wheel, which may have been a flywheel from a pump, figure 72, that's directly below. The appearance of the wheel embedded into the brick suggests that there is some depth to the brick debris. The field of construction debris extends 10 metres both sides of the foundations and down to a depth of approximately 5 metres. It appears that the debris descended to a natural stopping point. What does that mean? That it's been thrown into the river and left there to sink, I'm assuming. So that leads us to figure 73. The site plan of the underwater distribution of the construction debris. So we see 
the three meter depth denoted by that line, the six meter base of the channel depth, the large limestone block, the pump house foundation, and the entry to the tunnel, which would have been somewhere where I'm pointing there. Moving on. Okay, let's skip the Mount Lyle chemical works. We've already discussed that in, what was that, part two? Part one, I forget already. We'll have a quick look at the state engineering and implement works, 1913 to 1987. Just mainly wanted to note that it's government and this part, the government aimed to develop a local machinery industry whilst at the same time making eastern states and foreign imports too expensive for local farmers to purchase thereby ensuring their dependence on the locally made equipment. Thank you Hartley 2008 for that. Other than that, we really only need to know that it was active during the Second World War. That made the famous winged keel for Australia too, for the 1983 America's Cup. And let's look at the picture. I'm just trying to zoom in as much as I can on this image. I will note the source that it's got nothing to do with the Batty Library. WA 534Z Metro Regional I I'll have to look up where that actually came from. To begin with, and this is the first time I've noticed this, I've always looked at this funny shape in the river as odd and wondered about it but holy mother of god look at that what's that people what does that image resemble that shape so we've got the state engineering works here we're going to come back to this because this ridge and the way it suddenly turns there has always mystified me. Um, also, this building is not old world. There doesn't seem to be much old world here. And if you think I'm hinting at something, I am. And we'll come back to the proposed canal later. Uh, and down here further, we've got the superphosphate works, which we looked at previously. And on this side of the river, this was government land as well. So it's now all been reshaped considerably by the look of it and is now open to the public. Another piece of government real estate for sale. But would you look at that? I think we need autodidactic right now. Campbell, I think I found it. Um, I'm a bit dubious about the other images I have to go back and compare. So this, this is where another image looks like it's been filled in. But now looking at it again, I'm wondering if it wasn't this bit that was filled in. And this is where we see that quarrying image where it's all level. But they weren't quarrying. They were filling. So I've come back to this uh, CSR sugar refinery image that we looked at in Seven Hills Part 2 just to point out something else. Now I'll probably have to come back to it again at a later date because look at this. I didn't mention that at the time but I, that's a railway carriage on a bridge to nowhere. And I had wondered several times if there were bridges missing, bridges that we'd lost or another bridge across the river at some point that we don't know about. So we might be visiting that photo for a third time at a later date. I always feel a bit sus about particularly this line. But if we look down here, in regards to a canal, going off the page wait on let me zoom right in 
Okay, so this is meant to be the soap factory, I'm guessing. Look at the difference in the photo from there to here. Has that just been added in? That looks very dodgy. Why is that such a completely different colour to everything else? Even just to this. Have they pasted that in? And this is about the only um, older image I can find focusing on these red brick buildings in the HMAS Lewin. Given that it was meant to be built in, did he say 39 or 1940? These, all the other buildings are in blonde brick there's a couple of red brick this one could easily have been a, a redo i think all the other original buildings were only timber buildings from the old photos moving on at the risk of dragging this out way too long i will just read this and add my comments to it the post-industrial phase, the mid-1980s, was a defining period for North Fremantle. Industry around Rocky Bay ceased and the area was rezoned for residential use. The boatyards of Point Direction were replaced with multi-storey apartment buildings and the foreshore was landscaped, including the construction of a limestone seawall complete with private jetties. The former quarry sites of the State Engineering Works and the Mount Lyle Ch Chemical Plants were not easily redeveloped. An unfortunate legacy of these operations was extensive chemical contamination of the soils across both sites. The Mount Lyle chemical site was contaminated with heavy metals and chemical byproducts. The main contaminants were lead residues and lead sulfate scale, pyrite, iron sulfide, cinders from superphosphate production and highly acidic liquor used in gas scrubbers to control harmful emissions, which over time became contaminated with mercury, all of which were dumped on site. The soils of the State Engineering Works site were similarly contaminated. Chemical waste was found across the entire site and included burnt coal waste, clinker slag and pyritic cinders and contained levels of lead, arsenic, zinc, copper, iron, mercury and cadmium. Note that was an Environmental Protection Authority report. The contamination was not restricted to the soils as waste also leached into the waters of Rocky Bay. Heavy metal contamination was present on both the river foreshore and in local mollusks. A large scale cleanup operation removed contaminated soils from both sites. The drainage systems that led into the river were removed and a one metre layer of clean earth was placed across the site. Contaminants from the foreshore were also removed. It makes you wonder just how much was removed and added, doesn't it? These necessary steps potentially removed subsurface cultural material from the former State Engineering Works and Mount Lyle chemical sites. Upon completion of the clean-up operation, the land was sold to developers for housing overlooking Rocky Bay with views of the suburb of East Fremantle on the other side of the river. So this is stage two of a massive cover-up. In founding those sites, they've already implemented stage one, changed the face of the river entirely and totally obfuscated what was there. Moving on. Okay, we're gonna go really fast through chapter three, methodology, because it's not really relevant to the story we're telling here. But just note where he looked for his information, archival research, search of statutory databases, use of aerial imagery, both past and present, terrestrial archaeological survey, underwater remote sensing, underwater archaeological survey, and oral histories. The full list of references are in the thesis. Uh, if you want to come back and have a look at them, I'm just going to press on. Some of these we've looked at, some we haven't could make some interesting videos in the future. Let's see how that goes. Skipping ahead to 3.3, 33. 
terrestrial survey, I just want to note the northwestern part of the bay consists of water over one metre deep alongside vertical cliffs. This area was not to be included in the terrestrial survey. I'm not really sure why that is. Uh, and there is a bit of an explanation about falling rocks, falling rocks the size of a car. So I'll leave that to your imagination. Jumping ahead, 3.8, limitations of data, 3.8.1 historic photographs. Most photographs used in this project are labelled with a date range for when they were taken. In the case of aerial photography, usually a date and time is present on the image. However, the year of the earliest aerial photograph used, 1939, was estimated based on the level of development of the surrounding area. Historical research shows that the naval shore establishment HMAS Lewin was not built until 1940. Its absence from the circa 1939 photograph indicates the image was taken prior to 1940. So for the purposes of this study, the year of the image is indicated as circa 1939. Furthermore, the appearance of features and buildings within each aerial photograph utilized differed because of the time of day the image was taken the approach heading of the aircraft and the presence of shadows and reflection of sunlight. Photographs obtained from the collection held at the Batty Library are usually labelled with an estimated date range or date range, which may not always be accurate. Whaley finds out that almost the entire photographic historical record is photoshopped. So he's putting dates on things based on the Batty Library. Ba bow hand back your masters. Other limitations we might note, the side scan survey of Rocky Bay was carried out between Point Direction and Milo Beach by the Western Australia Maritime Museum. It was not until later that the target was identified further to the east and outside this area. For this reason, no side scan images were obtained for this site. While it is unlikely that other structures were present between Milo Beach and Minham Cove, it is possible that some material may have been missed. I think in general the side scan survey data is a bit pointless given how much filling and unfilling and refilling has been done. So this is Minham Cove here as far as I know. Uh, and this is Milo Beach. So I'm sure it was nothing important but Maybe it was the Blooming Parklands, which seem to be located in the water. Sorry, being silly now. Terrestrial survey, he notes two large limestone boulders fell approximately 10 metres from the cliffs and destroyed previously identified foundations within the survey area. In figure 12, each boulder was the size of a small car. As a result, for the public safety, the city of Fremantle closed the water's edge along the western part of the bay. That's convenient. For this reason, the area below the cliffs was not fully examined. Uh, also, the steepness of the embankment. I don't think it's natural embankment anyway. I don't think it's going to hold a lot for us. So, diving, he also noted that... Uh, due to reduced visibility and fast flowing current up to three knots that diving was difficult. Moving right along, chapter four, results. The combination of archival research and field work found that substantial remains still exist in Rocky Bay, both of the intertidal zone and beneath the water. Each site relates to a particular part of Rocky Bay's industrial and recreational past and is linked to both the early development of the Swan River Colony through the riverine transport trade as well as to one of the major development projects in Western Australian history, namely the building of the Port of Fremantle. There's also a whole lot of biogeology that remains and that same biogeology rocks with veins apparently through them exist in the breakwaters of the port of Fremantle. So I wouldn't argue that that's where that stone came from but that's a whole other past that's not being considered here. 
previously recorded Indigenous sites, an examination of the DIA AHIS database found 12 previously recorded Aboriginal heritage sites surrounding Rocky Bay in the suburbs of North Fremantle, East Fremantle and Mosman Park. These sites consisted of five mythological sites, two water sources, four artefact scatters associated with camping sites, one campsite, and only one site, Minim Cove, has been excavated. Archaeological excavations conducted in the 1970s by the Western Australian Museum in the vicinity of Minim Cove and the Colonial Sugar Refinery identified artefacts in association with charcoal that was dated to 10,000 before present. 10,000 years before present. Reference for that is Dorch 1975. For some reason I was called to look into Charles Dorch. I just had a quick look and according to his Wikipedia page, he's a US born archeologist, largely known for his life and works in Western Australia, born in Atlanta, Georgia. This caught my eye. He was also interested in the altered coast, shoreline and lakes of the Southwest where he investigated submerged sites. A significant site was that of Lake Jasper the first submerged Aboriginal site to be found in Australia. Moving on. These sites all provide tangible evidence of Indigenous occupation of the area surrounding Rocky Bay and of the utilisation of the Swan River by the local Noongar populations over a period of millennia. Previously recorded underwater sites, I won't go through the vessels if you're interested in the shipwrecks. This is them, two unidentified, the rest unknown. Some of them were moved. It was interesting that, that in 1990 both vessels were covered with sand. City of Perth was also covered with limestone rubble, presumably from the cliffs above. Then an inspection of these vessels in 2011 found that the appearance of both vessels had changed. The sand observed covering the wrecks in 1990 was mostly gone and a one metre wide trench was scoured around the hulls of both vessels. I wonder how that would happen. There's pictures, there's details if you're interested in the wrecks. Please go look. We're moving on to historic maps and plans. 4.3 Historic Maps and Plans The search of archival records held at the State Records Office found several historic maps and Public Works Department plans that featured Rocky Bay. These plans showed both proposed projects that were not carried out and projects that were undertaken and completed. These include a proposed 1874 canal works for the construction of a deep water access point within Rocky Bay to the Swan River. 1890s development of the Rocky Bay Quarry, 1894 depth soundings of Rocky Bay, the rail network leading to the State Engineering Works and Mount Lyle Chemical Works, a proposed water pumping station relating to the Mount Lyle Chemical Works dating to 1920, and 1917 stormwater drainage to the Swan River. Let's look at the proposed canal. 4.3.1, the proposed canal. Public Works Department Plan 1426 in figure 21 relates to an 1874 proposal for a canal through the limestone bedrock between Rocky Bay and the Indian Ocean that would have allowed deep water access to the Swan River. The plans indicate the intended orientation of the canal and the possible construction alternatives being crib work, rubble stone or concrete blocks for two protective breakwaters in figure 22. If this plan had been undertaken, it would have dramatically changed the landscape of the area. Hard to imagine, isn't it folks? North Fremantle would have become an island supporting a maritime port and larger vessels would have had access to the deep water channel of the Swan River, bypassing established traffic and pedestrian bridges, which could have led to the development of larger wharves and jetties closer to Perth. Okay, here we are. Figure 21, close-up of the proposed 
1974, that should read, and I did check, 1874 Canal from the Indian Ocean to Rocky Bay. Source, Public Works Department 1426 from the State Records Office. So first thoughts when I saw this were, yep, I've always wondered why on earth we didn't have an opening to the sea there because it's such a short space of land and as far as river transport would go it's a long way down to Fremantle and out again so from our official history we have William D. Vleming who supposedly was able to get boats into the river way back in whatever 16 something that was and then when the Brits arrived they talk about the river being closed so I don't know which is true and which isn't someone recently pointed out to me that if it had been an estuary and the river had been closed at the river mouth back then there would not have been oysters in the river which apparently there were my guess would be that it was open perhaps way back in Vlaming's time if any of that's even correct I'm not really going to bother with Wikipedia today but I did have to point out the ridiculousness of this image Willem D. Vleming's ships with black swans at the entrance to the Swan River, Western Australia, coloured engraving, derived from an earlier drawing, now lost, from the D. Vleming expeditions of 1696-97. So this is held at the National Library. So it's a copy of a now lost drawing showing Dutch ships and black swans. Swans, did you say? So if that's a man sitting down, that's a swan. Are they having a lend? These things look more like emus. I mean, how big a swan is it? Just for posterity's sake, this comes from our West Australia Day um, article telling us that we were founded, found in 1829. That's enough of that. And as we know, the British version of history is under question. So was it open? Was it closed? Was it closed somewhere in between? As we've all suspected, there was some kind of catastrophe that may have closed and, as I can see, buried many of the buildings in what they call limestone or basically just compacted sand and yet there's something else entirely going on in Rocky Bay and we'll come back to that, the biogeology side of it. Is this legit? We've seen many times that other people have found plans, so-called plans in quotations, that were quite likely something that did exist and has since been erased from the landscape. So let's pick this apart objectively. Starting up the top here, the Seven Sisters or the Seven Hills of Round Buckland Hill, I don't know which are the seven. And again, they they all look like plateaus. This one down here looks a bit like a mound, but then the rest of them all have these flat tops, which I find completely bizarre. Okay, then let's pick this canal apart. It struck me as odd that this was all black, but then what does the black depict? There's a lot of it. I can't tell if this is just a really, really bad image and I can't blow it up any further. It just becomes a big blur, but we'll go with what we've got. This is a distinct looking contour line or coastline. This is completely black. So proposed existing, I couldn't tell you. The strange part is the railway is in the same place. The road is in the same place as it is now or very close to. As far as a railway deviation around the canal, somebody please explain to me why you would go across the river, around the water, touching land in points and then back around the water to line up with the existing line in Fremantle and then this 
continues on all the way to the roundhouse, which we have discussed in a prior episode, and Arthur Head, the, the railway line now continues through and beyond heading down to South Fremantle, but seems to be at a junction here at the roundhouse, which made me go back again, another delay, and look at the roundhouse again, and we're going to have to revisit that video. Don't think I'm going to have to apologise about any of the conclusions I've made, but to look at the roundhouse again as a potential railway roundhouse, which actually makes a lot more sense for the name because it's not round as we discussed. It's a decagon or decagonal, however you'd like to call it. Was it something to do with railways though? And maybe that's why they took the entirety of Arthur Head away. We'll come back to that. Meanwhile, so if they've deviated the railway line to go to build a canal, they haven't deviated the road. And as far as I know, there were no other bridges. So now we have the Narrows at Kings Park there in Perth City as a means to cross the river. I believe there was a ferry there at some point linking Perth City and South Perth. And the causeway all the way down the river at Burswood was, East Perth, sorry, was the only way to get across the river. So where did the road go and why is there no road deviation or bridge or was there? And we know from previous videos that there was way more to Fremantle City. There was way more to, this is East Fremantle, which we covered way, way back when we looked at a lot of these buildings in the flesh, not pretty drawings of them. So there are old world buildings all through here. There's an obelisk. Is this just a fantasy? Was there... I mean, to me, the whole thing looks like a fantasy because who puts streets in around plateaus and leaves the plateaus there? It looks like a subdivision. I don't know. So where to begin, folks? I have struggled so much with this image because there's just so much that it wants to tell. According to the marine charts, and yes, I was studying marine navigation at the time so I was able to get access to a couple of charts without having to hand over money and we have a match here Eleanor rocks this is all still very similar uh, there's a change here but then this point is here here oh these depths hang on Comparing depths to, sorry, I better be clear on that. These are in fathoms. So one fathom is equal to 1.8288 metres or exactly six feet. So if we're looking at depth wise, six fathoms would be just shy of 11 metres and three in the shallower areas, three fathoms just for reference sake would be about five and a half metres. So... If we've got four and a half there, that's 1.3, similar-ish depths. Then we get, I have another chart so we can look at the depths in the river. Uh, this was the hydrographic chart from the Australian Hydrographic Department. And this shows us, so here is roughly where we're looking at potentially for a canal and I'll narrow it down a bit further for us. Interestingly, out here where it's all shallower is where these breakwaters would have been. Uh, up here, there's a bit shallower here. This is all where the supposed wreck was of, what ship is it? Can't remember the name of the ship. But there's a memorial there to Fleming. And then on this image, we have a historic wreck sea note. Unfortunately, I didn't take a photo of the note. But there are obstructions noted. And then when we go to 
the transport authority charts which is different again we get the same we get this shallow areas and up here near the cable station which we looked at in Cottesloe we have cables artificial surf reef uh, and there's another reef up here so let's just have a quick look if there's anything else I can point out there reef which covers and uncovers that would be this one breakers rock awash is this one and underwater rock is this one what can we see here reef that uncovers rock awash uh, so this is breakers the breakers on the reef right I'm with it now okay and there's the obelisk at Buckland Hill where we started this was interesting because when I went back to my notes I have 1874 Buckland Hill was 66 meters high and here we are with the directional white red and green light that I talked about at Buckland Hill being 66 meters high so we've technically only lost a few meters off the top of Buckland Hill from 1874 and installed a reservoir and extended it and ignored all the tunnels and caves and whatnot underneath the plot just thickens further and further people this has been all added um, we'll come back to the harbour I'll just pop in a quick look at that chart of the river as well so by way of explanation we've got the deeper blue is up to five meters in depth the lighter blue is up to 10 meters and the white areas whitish are above 10 meters so applying that in the river you've got that's your deeper section there between 5 and 10 meters around here is the deep water channel which kind of disappears here entirely and disappears here entirely as well and then coming around you get into the deeper section which is the white area above 10 meters so these areas where we were looking at our little star 40 bits it's as low as 0 0.9 in this area and then it sharply drops away to 5 and then up to 11 in a very small space and around here the deep water channel has all but disappeared there's only 3.2 meters there but you've got eight over here seven seven and in this star 40 shape here as low as 0.3 of a meter 0 0.3 of a meter so while she's smaller boats can cut through no problem because they don't have keels or deep drafts the bigger boats must stick to the outside of the channel and then up here which is looking like a very straight channel really is amongst the deepest part of the river I did find there was a slightly deeper part and we'll talk about that at a later date so the deep water channel seems to have disappeared mostly here so it's around four meters five meters four meters and over here as low as three meters right where canal may have been okay let's look a little bit more closely so this was the bit that was really doing my head in could it be possible could I find any evidence for it not really other than as we've seen the images of the river and this strange slope is it here is that where I'm looking at yes strange slope here so if we put ourselves down in this street we're looking at a slope here if we put ourselves down here you'll see the extent of the height of the slope so there's a big height difference the other way this is rocky bay down here okay that's the kind of level and I walked all along here there's signs all along this fence line at the top of all the retaining that says soil nails used so they've put a lot of effort in to try and 
build this housing estate and make the land workable for housing it's a completely different shape to what they show us way back when with the state engineering works where it was supposedly level I do have a comparison this was about the best I could do where well, this is all level they must have dug down a lot further anyway as noted we've got the western side and we've got the northern-ish side they're completely different they're completely different landscapes when you compare from the water's edge. There's a lot of rubble and rocks thrown in here. It tends to peel away a little bit down here and you get a little bit more actual rock face. But here it's, let me find the right image. That's not it, that's it. So here, this is where I'm gonna talk about all the biogeology around uh, this would be the soap factory here there's some really really odd I can't say rock it's not even rock I don't know what it is there's veins in it peeps there's bones uh, and then this over this side is all filled in it's rocks it's just rocks Okay, I'm just going to pop back to this thesis for a moment and we'll finish looking at the bits around the canal and the bay. 4.3.2, the Rocky Bay Quarry and the Port of Fremantle. Public Works Department plans relating to the construction of the Port of Fremantle provide valuable insight to the physical environment of Rocky Bay prior to and during the 1890s. Public Works Department Plan 2034 was produced in 1890 prior to the commencement of the Harbour Works, Figure 23. It is a topographic survey map of the Seven Sisters formation produced to ascertain the quantities of limestone available at Rocky Bay for the construction of the port. Public Works Department 2034 plan also shows the original shoreline of the bay in Figure 24. Public Works Plan 3801 contains plans 3702, 3712, 3729. Okay, Plan 3702 is a simple plan of Rocky Bay produced in 1895, three years after the commencement of quarrying, and was the base map for information given in Public Works Department Plans 3712, 3729 and 3801. So... They're drawing plans off plans here, not plans off what was actually there. Public Works Department Plan 3712 details depth soundings within Rocky Bay and these soundings are represented as cross sections of the riverbed as detailed in Plan 3729. I think the point there being that three years after the commencement of quarrying was when they decided on the base map. Hmm wonder why they waited that long. Quarrying at Rocky Bay commenced in 1893. From the outset, limestone detritus was pushed into the river. The emerging level platform against the river's edge became the foundations of the initial rail bed used to take the limestone out of the quarry. Figure 25. As quarrying continued, limestone rubble was continually deposited into the river. In 1895, concerns were raised about the narrowing of the deep water channel in Rocky Bay as a direct result of the dumping of limestone detritus from the quarry. A report was commissioned for the Legislative Assembly to discuss the rapid filling of the channel, West Australian Parliament, 1895. Okay, uh, these are the breakwaters at the mouth of the canal. This one's an interesting one. The topographic survey, now when I studied drafting I studied plans so as far as I can tell the smaller circles are going to be the highest points and then these contour lines, sorry that was my stomach if anyone heard that, these contour lines spread out. What are these dark patches? Tunnels? Look at those. And this deep, dark 
section in the bottom corner here. What's happened there? Someone spilled their coffee on that. So these dark shaded areas have me totally miffed. Then, okay, the other original shoreline of Rocky Bay in 1892 doesn't help us a heck of a lot. And then this picture, commencement of Rocky Bay Quarry in 1892 looking east. So that's looking back towards Perth City, um, upriver. And it all looks like it's already been pushed into the water there as well. But just to state the obvious, that could be anywhere, anywhere in the world that has limestoney, sandy ground. So continuing, the report found that the deep water channel was in danger of becoming too narrow for vessels to navigate safely and from that time, the practice of dumping into the river ceased. A trace of the 1892 shoreline set over a modern day photograph of the bay demonstrates that the northern side of the channel was filled in by a distance of 70 metres, that's in length, not depth. A survey of the river conducted by Commander L.S. Dawson, R.N., between December 1895 and May 1896, found that since the commencement of the quarry works, the original inward curve of the bay no longer existed, and where the depth of the channel was originally 5 fathoms, 9.1 metres, it was now only 18 feet, 5.4 metres, against the new shoreline. Plan 3712, dated July 1895, illustrates through soundings and cross-sections that the western part of the bay maintained its depth, but the areas adjacent to the quarry are severely encroached upon. Comparison between the 1892 and modern shorelines indicates that the shoreline in the eastern part was not affected. So, figure 26 Gives us a bit of a look at where he has imposed the 1892 shoreline over the modern photo. But that's if the 1892 shoreline was correct anyway. There's a long time between arriving and mapping the river, considering how they built all around it. So finishing up there, the deep water channel in Rocky Bay was dredged in the 1960s, increasing its depth to greater than 8 metres. The spoil was used to reclaim land further downstream. The creation of a new channel through the shallows on the southern side of the river in the 1970s saw the deposition of spoil back into the channel, reducing the depth to 5 metres. Spoil was also deposited on the southern shore, creating a new area that became the location for recreational grounds and a yacht club. So they filled it, they've unfilled it, they filled it, they've unfilled it. What do you make of that? Yep, definitely spoke too soon. I knew I'd come back to this photo. So we're back at the CSR sugar refinery image that shows the cliff faces. Looking closely at these cliff faces, although we can't see the Woggle Cave, that seems to be blocked off. This stone looks somewhat consistent with what is still there and this is definitely the dingo flower building as far as I can tell but then these shallows don't seem to make much sense this is what they talk about the intertidal zone is this what's added this dark patch so there's a dead looking tree back there there's a dead looking tree here I still think it's edited but this is where we're looking and where's the state engineering works and where's Mount Lyle chemical works and why is this bank so gently sloping when it's now steep and dangerous and covered in rock full so this is a 1930s image 1930 if you can rely on the Batty library just going to take a quick look at this one before we move on. The Department of Land Administration, dollar, 1963 image that we just saw. 
I slotted in there. Uh, that looks photoshopped, as does this. And a lot of little white patches in here. Yes, it could be sand. It's a sandy area. But it doesn't look right to me. If I zoom in any further though, all you're going to get is pixels. So it's really hard to say. But just looking at that alone. Is that Photoshop? Is that an accident? Did something happen to the image? This is all a little bit sharp for my liking. Something's happened there. So if they've messed with this, they've no doubt messed with this. I've just put these two images next to each other, the one on the left being 1963 and the one on the right being 1959, just showing the vast differences between the two. Level of focus is interesting. So this was the one that I thought had been altered. There has, by the look of it, been a new road gone through or photoshopped in. This one is a much more distinctive photo. And then when you compare this landmass, sorry, it's not quite the same zoom level. This landmass with this sand mass. There's definitely been alterations done on this photo. Why they started in 1963 and they didn't edit the 1959 image, I don't know. Okay, I'll just throw this one in as well while we're here. Uh, soap factory over here, Rocky Bay, CSR, whatever the white place is that doesn't look quite right. This section of the river, this is the first time I've noticed this part too. It looks to be a completely different shape to what's there now. Uh, it's all been reclaimed by the look of it. And the deep water channel follows around. So it's never ending, folks. So this is the housing estate. It looks substantially level, but it steps up all the way until you get back up here. Again, soap factory, woggle cave, strange biogeology. I'll wait till I get to the harvest road end. Something totally different again and all filled in here. So here we see how close the coast is. And this ledge, let us put, where did Google go? Come back Google. So this ledge, I'll just give you a quick idea of what it looks like. It's covered in bushes, so it's a bit difficult to say, but that drops away there. And then here, this is all new world. Now I know it's red brick, but I've looked closely at it. It's not old world and it's just a facade on a factory. So I have had a quick look at the history. I'm not going to go into it. I'm looking here, this factory, on this side of the ledge. I'm going to wait. We'll look at the front just so you can see what I'm talking about. It looks a little bit oldie worldy, but it's not. Tilda Bay Brewing. If we travel down here, this block, which I'll come back to, that's New World. That's really stodgy brickwork after looking at some of the Old World brickwork. We have here is where the Old World buildings start. We've got chimneys and building styles that match that Old World. And then... Old world, look at that one. And then we get into some of the factories in North Fremantle. To me, the space where, because these are old world here too, little old houses on this side of Stirling Highway on the water side, and it drops away behind them where the railway line goes through. 
This is the only... Stop that. <laughs> Damn it. Stupid labels. Okay, this to me, between these old world houses here where the stars are and these are here, the old world buildings, this is the only place it could possibly have been according to the buildings and what's left. So that would have the lower point here and the canal coming through here. So this corner has been filled and the canal covered up. Maybe that happened naturally, but judging by the amount of rocks and the supposed need to hold a parliamentary inquiry into dumping into the river, sure, sure, as an excellent way to cover it up. This has all been filled. So it could have been here. And then, of course, my head went crazy with, well, you know, what would the landscape have looked like? Was the coast even in the same spot, though, back then, if there was a canal? And if we're seeing star 40 kind of shapes in the river here, it's going to point to the canal having been real and existing. And is that what they've really covered up here? I'm going to hazard a guess and say just one of a myriad of things. If we've lost a canal, we've lost a star fort. Mind blown, people. Absolutely mind blown. I'm just going to drop the little man down onto the coast side as well and see what we can see from that end. So we've got the railway line. This is opposite the brewery, this footbridge that comes all the way across to the beach. These are the old world structures. These are the new world structures. Let's see what we can see over here. Old world up to somewhere in here. Also, I did think this was kind of odd. Where does that go? What's in there? That goes through a retaining wall under the train line. I wonder what that is. And at the risk of bordering on obsession, I've got this old image up. I thought we better have a look because it answers a couple of questions or perhaps it creates more. We've got, this is where that blocked off entrance would have been. So was it an underpass under the railway lines? That would indicate that there was a station there potentially for this Matilda Bay Brewery, which was originally Ford. They made motor cars in Western Australia, for those of you that don't know. Uh, so it looks like the station was located here, perhaps. These are the old world buildings that I said are still there and pointed out. These buildings seem to be sitting in the rock or sand. And I will note that that is whited out in a couple of images of similar time frame to this. Some of this looks like it's lacking depth. I tell you, when I look at these images, some of the houses, I just see that, remember that footage of the house being nuked? And of course the camera is obviously nuclear proof to withstand the blast, but the house is just a model anyway. Um, I see that often when I look at these aerial images. I just wonder, I can't, you know, I can't guarantee or say for sure how much these images have been edited, especially when they come from the Batty Library. This one is still uh, here, that's still standing. This building always miffed me. In this photo, it looks like it runs uphill. It's always very clearly printed on. This is where I'm envisaging the canal might have been. 
what else can I see? So this would be the, the block that I think didn't exist, which lines up perfectly with that white spot. So are they covering something up in the water here? Uh, other than that, some of this looks very flat. There's a big rise up here. It's quite a big hill. And when you walk up it, you realize what a big hill it is. So it's all looking a bit flat. Uh, that could be the Woggle Cave. Most of it unrecognizable. Just so I throw that in, I'll leave you the link. And just cleaning up this final block for us. So Matilda Bay Brewery. I've looked thoroughly around this block. I can't see any old world buildings, but there may once have been. These are all brand new. This is all the field land that has been reclaimed from the State Engineering Works and was previously covered in railway lines. There's also nothing saying that it wasn't a covered canal or tunnel, but I just thought this was very odd. I put myself in the right spot. This is the field former state engineering works land with all new houses. Matilda Bay Brewery, this street potential old world but to me looks just like it was built out of leftovers. This retaining wall between the sides of the road and it's not a new wall so this is, I'm going to guess went in, maybe when this went in, but I can't say for sure. And one last thing, just about building the railway line up, because that was all definitely built up. Uh, and this is land that was used as a fuel depot, so that's depicted in a lot of the old aerial photos with fuel tanks on it but I wanted to look at where are we next to the railway line I think it's here yeah these tiny little houses look at the height of the railway line versus the roof height of the houses so that la that railway line is built up well after these houses were built and these are definitely little old world cottages with the chimneys and that one's heavily retained. It's almost buried under the road and we're only just over the rise. If we can get there. Look at those chimneys. Just over the rise from the heavily retained church. Oh, goodness. So from the lower side. Hmm. Wow. Even more retaining added in now. Okay, well, it wasn't a case of saving the best till last. It was kind of a case of, oh my goodness, I am so out of my depth here. But I learnt anatomy for a reason and it wasn't to become a naturopath apparently because here I am. So let's have a go. What I did want to point out that I noted was there was no shells. There was a few things, the limestone, that could potentially have been coral or something like that. But then when you start looking at features in the human body, and that's assuming what I'm talking about is anything even akin to human, if it was any other species. I mean, to me, this photo looks like a snake's head. But I, I actually think that that's the 
end of a long bone and that opening would be where the marrow is but how can you know I mean I'm trying to find body parts of something or some things that died goodness knows how many hundreds or thousands of years ago maybe even more so whenever I thought I'd just skip it and tell myself I'm seeing things and it's not real this image would come back to me and this piece of bone or whatever it is truth in plain sight so that's on display on the walk right above Rocky Bay almost directly where the canal may have been and I couldn't help but notice that this texture is very different to the external texture could this have been some kind of bone I did kind of wonder but then looking around the rest of it I get that gave me pause now just to give you a size comparison that's part of a broken bottle so probably a third to half of say a small beer bottle these are actually quite large like in the human body these things are drastically smaller of course depending on the size of the bone Okay, so this is what I was thinking of. And Stellium7 has talked a lot about bone in his videos. So trabeculae versus with the solid bone towards the outside. I don't know. You know, I'm not saying I'm right here. I'm just putting it out there. Those with eyes for this will either pick it up and run with it or... I'm just having flights of fantasy. Uh, this one, doing the bone marrow, again, comparison. Mm. But again, human. I, I don't know what I'm looking at. Am I looking at a woggle? Am I looking at some other kind of creature? I woke up a couple of mornings thinking about those giant sea creatures that you see on the old maps I thought, what are you trying to tell me here spirit are we looking at a giant axolotl or something uh, what else stood out that again is trabeculae close up version this actually really reminded me of here we go this one so this is right near the woggle cave just above it tunica or lining of a vein wall of a vein or an artery this and the size of this I would have been able to put my foot in that gap at the bottom there this would be another vein or artery leading off it and over here more and more of them I mean it could be something like coral but it's not naturally formed limestone as you would imagine it stone where does stone come from so what else did I have same in a different color um, the bone I see a lot of holes in it now this looks like it's been patched with concrete I'm a bit dubious about that but this was a little bit intriguing what else did I have for us this is supposedly a rock what is that now the first I looked at it I went well was there a post in it or something but it's a bent post up here the holes bit like a sponge but then what is that this 
this one nearby the other potential trabeculae. This looks like a vessel, some sort of blood vessel. Let me zoom that in for you. Look at that separate lining. I'd love to go there in the rain and see how the colour changes when it's wet. Intestinal blood vessels. Don't mind the colours. These are scanning electron microscope images. The colours are added to help differentiate the tissue. So these would be blood cells, I'm assuming. But again... I don't know, folks. Like I said, every time I tried to tell myself I was mad and I was seeing things, I kept coming back to truth in plain sight. And every time I look at it, I see something different. This is the first time I'm noticing in here this reddish bit. What is it? And then, and then, this rock wall. So uh, the soap factory would be back this way a little bit. And this is the un excavated unfilled original section so we are north of the Woggle Cave but same rock face I mean I could just spend all day looking at that and apologies it's not the greatest image I had to take photos with my phone it was an unplanned trip but the creator saw fit to put me there, so I had to make the most of it. I was wondering how on earth I was going to get out on the river to look at this without having to pay for a boat or a drone or something. And I did meet someone with a drone, but I was worried that uh, if she ditched her drone in the river, I wouldn't be able to help her pay for it. So... Maybe if I can get back there and get another look. But what? And is this stairs? Is this some kind of... It did kind of remind me of an esophagus that has these bands of cartilage through it. What is it? What is it, people? Rock. So they tell us. Limestone. Melted buildings is the other option. Some sort of melted or liquefied structures because we have these openings. I don't know. I'd like to call in forensics. Help. I did see a few of these too in my walk. So this, this to me looks 100% like a blood vessel. Look at that. It's got the hollow through the middle, then you've got the layers. Looks like flesh. But there were a few like this, with plants growing in the top of them. Zoom that. Lousy photos, but... Still fertile. Well, if there was a canal here, sorry, between these buildings and there's enough space and the railway line would have gone over here and around the water, notice the shallow bit there, would have gone around the water and down to, all the way down to here, the roundhouse, which is decagonal. It must have been one heck of a plan, folks. Not real in any way, just a plan. Okay, and at the very other end of Rocky Bay to where the proposed canal might have been, we have this unusual occurrence, which is like stone on top of ground. It does seem to go across the road, so this must have been cut out for the road to run down. 
and the road is sloping down but this is also sloping down as well and you can see underneath this big stone ledge where the ground is slowly coming away and let's see if we can get a bit closer it's a lot redder in this area there's a lot more red coloring through the limestone limestone whatever it is so that the grain is downwards animal mineral vegetable what do you think people see and strange channels through it channel blood vessel tendon I don't know yeah so in an unequal slope to the road well so I'd like to claim that I've found a star fort I've only found a tiny piece of it as far as I can tell and just how big was it so as I've mentioned previously these angles are interesting pointing due south and due east this sand spit we're going to come back and look at you've got golf courses all around uh, you have Royal Freshwater Bay Yacht Club which is a mud flutter and I've spent some time there looking at that um, this is another interesting angle there's things under the water here uh, What else have I got? Ah, where could I mean? There's there's some majorly obvious missings if we're looking for a star fort, and that would be a cathedral, for one. Citadel. This reservoir is interesting. This is a big pool. Another underground reservoir and a water tower. And there's some very odd stone around this uh, reservoir facility as well. With, whoops, with patched pieces. Layers in it. And then different again. Is that covered in concrete? Or something entirely different? This is a very high point too, peeps. It's very high up the hill. Yeah, just pop around the other side of the block and have another look over there. Mm. Hard to see. better no it's all grassed Robbie well, I had wondered if there was something under there now that I've started looking at reservoirs that's higher than everything else around it by the look of it wait what's this house
think Border Corporation might have a bit to tell us. I'd love to see some of their old maps that I never got to see and plans. That was a big thing when I worked at Water Corporation. A lot of the old infrastructure they had no plans for and I mean they have their excuses why but it seems quite odd that they wouldn't keep these things especially that the Public Works Department seems to still have images of star fort pieces in the river. That's got to make you wonder again. So I'll leave it here for now, I think, folks, and we'll come back. One thing I can tell you about Bicton without going too far is uh, there are a number of caves within the precinct study areas. Let me just blow that up so you can read it. So this was something else that I looked at. There are a number of caves within the precinct study area. At Rocky Bay, there are two small caves within the limestone cliffs. There appear to be many caverns and tunnels in the Bicton area. The Bicton caves are low and narrow, around a metre in diameter and up to 200 metres in length. An underground stream which flowed through the limestone has gradually eroded the rock, forming caves Stalactites are formed by rainwater seeping through the above soil. So there's probably lots more to look at there. I don't know if I'll find any more information about tunnels because it seems to always disappear. That's why I'm throwing that bit in now in case it does. And I wanted to also look at the strange shape down here. To me, that looks completely unnatural as far as a river goes. So. Is there more there or was there more taken out there? Um, and again, up here, strange shape. And you're looking at the Claremont area up here and there's tons of oldie worldie buildings in there as well. Plenty more for another day. And I thought it was gonna be over when I made this video. All right, I know I've skipped a lot of the thesis. I'm sure you won't mind and I'm give you the link if you wish to come back and look at it yourself. Just to wrap up, he points out that the survey of the riverine and underwater landscapes of Rocky Bay provided insight into the area's industrial past, how its natural resources were used and the purposeful discard of material into the surrounding environment. They talk a bit about, so there's lots of red bricks, there's lots of reused railway lines all the way through so he talks about that a lot in the shipyards i'll wrap up the thesis for us here with this very topical paragraph finally this investigation demonstrated the potential for archaeological sites to exist beneath the waters of the swan river while this may seem to be an obvious statement, it serves as a reminder to heritage management agencies that not all important heritage sites exist above the water and that in some cases, as demonstrated in Rocky Bay, underwater sites and sites located in the intertidal zone may constitute some of the few remains of past activities, industrial or otherwise, within the Swan River. Yep. I'm going to agree with that. Well, thanks everyone for being here with me today. I hope you got something out of that and I hope it doesn't rattle around in your head for months like it has done for me. You at least got a ordered, organised version of. Meanwhile, I'll be back as soon as I can. Uh, a lot on at the moment, trying to get out of my house before the bank takes it from me. But that's what happens when you deliberately don't pay your mortgage and refuse to get a real job. Doing life a little bit differently these days. Take care everyone. Welcome to the new subscribers. Share, like, comment. Love to know what you thought of all that. See you soon. Take care. Bye.